website going? It's what's projected right now. So if you brought technology with you, uh, to get online, you can go to Guest APS. Don't go to APS Guest. You won't be able to get online because they're rebooting the server. It's Guest APS. Nice and confusing. Um, and then right at the top, you can see www.padlet.com slash wall slash tab Colorado. And it's kind of like an interactive desktop where you can publish notes and links and photos and all these sort of things onto that page. So we encourage you guys to post things in there, post reflections or observations during the conference. There's also links to um, the things from the center. That's that green link. There's a contact link, which is that kind of colorful one, which is another wall that you can put your contact information, websites, stuff like that. So we encourage you guys to be using that throughout the conference. And it'll be up forever, I hope. So you can come back in months and still find all this information. And that's where we'll also be posting videos of this conference and the different talks and stuff. So pretty cool thing. Okay, welcome. All right. Um, I'd like to introduce Clyde Gaw, who's going to start us off with the keynote this morning. Um, Clyde actually first uh, encountered TAB in its baby days um, in 2004 at the Denver NADA. So he came out here and a group of a whole lot of people got inspired from that. But um, Clyde and uh, Nan especially, they formed kind of a, a board with Kathy and Diane and have been instrumental in, in keeping it alive and active and networking around the country. He has been head of TAP classroom since then and has been teaching about almost 20 years in, at your elementary school? Uh, 20, 29 at my current elementary school. Oh. Uh, in Indianapolis, yeah. <laughs> That's another round for plus. Yeah. And is a huge, spends so much time being an advocate at and working in advocacy with NEA and then also in the state government in Indianapolis. Um, just in all ways that he can figure out how to be an advocate to move art forward. Thanks for coming along. yesterday, and um, as, as all the TAB teachers in here know, when the kids come into the art room, they're just so excited to be in a place where they can express their ideas, and it's a natural kind of a event for them, because they're biologically connected to art making in that way. It's, they're just, it's... It's a matter of evolution, is what I've come to realize. And so, what I saw taking place in Dale's art room was, I'm sure you've probably seen similar experiences. Um, it was the last class of the day. I, I saw three classes, and it was the last class of the day. And um, uh, she started the class out with a five-minute gathering, large group gathering. Sometimes large group gatherings can take place anywhere, but she had she had her group in a gathering area, and I, I was uh, thrilled to sit in the back and just be the fly, be the fly on the wall, and so there was three, three sculpture artists, and Nan pulled them over to the front of the class, and so they had these beautiful little foam sculptures, and uh, the first little girl, she says, this is my Winter Park uh, camp out sculpture. <coughs> And uh, she proceeded to tell the entire class about her sculpture. And then at the end of her, her uh, story, and then she says, now, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, I, I was like, you know, this is, this is the kind of uh, learning opportunity that I don't think happens enough in schools. And uh, it, it, it happens quite often in, to have room where children can express time-sensitive ideas. 
And uh, so then the other, the other interesting thing that took place, well, there were a lot of interesting things taking place. First of all, the kids were just turned on big time uh, being in, in Dale's room. And uh, at, at uh, the end of the school day, there's a bell that goes off. And, and all in unison, all of the, uh, the children go, no. <laughs> now it's Friday afternoon, school's going to be let out. And all the kids hear the bell that says school's you know, over. And uh, they all in unison are, are you know, with a voice that could kind of rise from the depths of their insides. It's like, no, because they are so engaged in what they're doing. And uh, it's, it's a natural thing when you give children choices and they become uh, personally involved in what they're doing and they have a voice. So that was really exciting for me to be in Dale's room and I got a thrill uh, of being in there with all of our students. It's really, it was a real fun time. But I started teaching art in 1984 and uh, I was trained in, uh, to be a DBAE teacher at Indiana University. <coughs> Some of my teachers were Enid Zimmerman and Guy Hubbard, Gil Clark. Um, they're experts in DBAE. And uh, Enid, um, um, she's a big proponent of, proponent of creativity also. And, and uh, she wrote a, 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 a nice piece, uh, uh, I believe it was her Lowenfeld lecture about creativity. And I'm reading uh, her what she's talking about in her uh, piece on creativity. I'm thinking, this is a tab classroom. This is what creativity is all about. <coughs> And so, um, so after I got my education at IU, um, I started teaching in the, uh, uh, as a sub-teacher in Indianapolis Public Schools for about four months. Indianapolis Public Schools is the largest school district in the state of Indiana. And I was interested in working in the urban core. And so uh, being a sub for Indianapolis Public Schools is a real education in Itself. And um, uh, of course, I had the added advantage of being an art teacher, so I could mesmerize the children with my drawing ability. And you know, we, you know, we could, I could do. I was just a young teacher. I really was just learning on the fly. And uh, think, oh, this is great. You know, I can draw. You know, we had a, some lesson on uh, airplanes, uh, and it was a scripted lesson. And I, I drew airplanes for them on the blackboard. And they're like, wow. And, uh, and so the the you know the visual you they see the visual they see the scent the uh, the multi sensory uh, experience of seeing something that is an image and it just was you know the children were very much uh, engaged in that event that little mini event so they, I'm beginning to take things in and seeing what works with heterogeneous groups of kids and heterogeneous is uh, a word I like to use a lot because it describes a classroom of kids. Every kid is different. Every kid has a unique structure of mind. Every kid, uh, because of their genetic, intrinsic genetic makeup and their neurology and their brain, has a direct effect on their personality and how they how they are able to learn. Um, Genetics affects a lot about the human mind, but we don't talk about that in education very much, at least not in from the circles that are policymakers that I see uh, uh, who are meeting out education policy. They don't, they don't really care about that, but <laughs> teachers who, who are where the rubber hits the road, we see it all the time. And you really see it in a tab classroom where it's expressed. <laughs> it's expressed right there before your very eyes, when you let kids go off into a, you let a class go off into, in Dale's room, there were six centers open, and, you know, they were, you know, boom, you could see uh, Howard Gardner's MI theory at work right there. Multiple intelligences, bingo, right there. And so, uh, you see children uh, engaged in a variety of activities and interest, to, interest in a choice classroom. And, um, you know, it's every time you, we're teaching, we see this heterogeneity 
it just it, it is it's it's dealing with nature so um, and that's what teachers do we deal with raw forces of nature um, I had the good fortune after um, I was laid off from IPS I, I taught uh, I was I taught art at a IPS school in, uh, uh, right uh, in the inside of the city right next to downtown and had the good fortune of uh, learning uh, through that event and um, a lot of high needs children and um, and then I got laid off I got ripped and I'm like where am I going to go and so I was lucky that there was an opening at a uh, at a school uh, outside the city in a suburban area uh, a rural suburban um, and it was called New Palestine as the community that hired me. So I've been fortunate to work at New Palestine Elementary for the past, going on 29 years. And, um, and so my, my career has been primarily at New Palestine Elementary. And uh, for the first 20 years of my career there, I was a DBAE teacher who was slowly sliding into choice but didn't really know it. Um, I was, you know, after I do a DBA lesson, you know, kids are like, well, I'm finished, Mr. Goff, what, what do you want me to do now? Mm -hmm. Like, well, okay, you can do this, you can do this, or you can do this. And so I started doing choice after, you know, as a response, a pragmatic response. You, you know, as a, as a teacher, you got to do what you got to do, and it's pragmatism, what I see in choice-based education at work. John Dewey's... Uh, theory of his pragmatic uh, ideas about education. You do what you have to do to engage children. And if that means working through their interests to really engage them, then that's what you got to do. So after 20 years, I, start, I slowly started to slide into choice, but I really didn't know it. And I didn't know anything about choice-based art education. But I was uh, teaching a gifted class with a, a colleague of mine, a new uh, sharpshooter from Purdue University, his name is Clark Freilich, and uh, he was into technology. He's kind of like Adam. He's got a knack for technology. And I was watching Adam, you know, he was working his computer. He's like, he's gifted at it. Some people have a capacity to be really good at different kinds of things. It's innate. And uh, I'm not very good at technology. I, I love to learn and play on it and do work on the computer and read and write. And, um, but I'm not good at manipulating technology and making it work for me. But I saw Adam do that, and that's what Clark could do. Clark was this wizard out of Purdue, and um, he was one of Bob Sable's students. And um, uh, so Clark, Clark and I taught a G&T class, and he, one day he says to me, he says, hey, I'm uh, thinking, you know, you know how, I, how much I like technology. I was thinking about doing this, this uh, uh, pr this grant proposal through the state of Indiana, we would be uh, we would get involved in electronic portfolio development as an assessment tool. I said, "Hey, this sounds good to me." And uh, uh, so we got involved. He wrote the grant. He uh, we, we we became a part of their program in 1998. We were doing electronic portfolios in a K in an elementary setting before anybody was doing them. And of course, I was just watching and learning through Clark. He was like the guy who knew how to do this stuff. And so, uh, so I was kind of piggybacking on his shoulders. And during our, we started to implement electronic portfolios in our G&T class. We had one computer, and we would digitize the children's work that we would, you know, they would do a DBAE lesson, and we would digitize the children's work. And some of the kids were bringing in work from home. And we digitized that too. And so we were we have the children uh, write about their work from home and from our classes. Well, guess what? They didn't really care about the work they were doing in our classes, but they cared deeply about the work they were doing at home. And they would write copiously uh, with about their art, their home art. Now, George Sakelli, who is a friend of, of Tab, George is the, uh, he's a, uh, an art education treasure, and uh, he's the area head of art education at uh, University of Kentucky, and he's wrote many books on art education. 
And uh, one of the things George talks about is the home art connection. The home art connection is uh, critical because if you think about the learning process, what you're doing at home, uh, you can do at school and you can build on these lines of thought and on these on these ideas that are, are working from your head. So you have the, the art learning that can take place through a home art connection can be extremely meaningful and very deep. And um, so that's something that naturally occurs in a tab classroom. Because the art making is very, very, um, it's a part of the child. And so, um, so that's a very good thing. I, I wanted to show you a, a quick video of Clark in, in action working at our summer art camp. We have a, we run a summer art camp, um, and we've been doing it for maybe our fourth year. And um, we do the summer art camp is another learning experience. It's really what education should be about. And imagine three and a half hours with all the materials you need. Class of about 20 kids. You got three and a half hours to follow lines of thought, to work on personally meaningful subject areas. So here's just a, this is a clip of Clark working with one of his students in our summer art camp, and we're working on we're working on experiments with gravity. We're always talking about the different STEM connections and design elements. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, I'm very sorry. I turned the volume down here. Uh -huh. See, I told you I was very good with technology. Oh, you have a spiral right over here. That is wicked. So we, so our summer art camp, really you think about how education should should take place, and uh, it's you know we we have you know twenty kids. 12 kids, three and a half hours, two teachers, and all kinds of materials. We have our bring everything that we usually have in our classrooms. And um, it's the way, in my mind, education should be. Uh, children get attention from the teacher. You think about the way schools are today, and they're designed to mass produce learning experience through a behaviorist paradigm. And uh, it's it is uh, it it takes it's it it comes at a price. Now, I don't want to get into all the, the, the difficulties that are taking place because of the way schools are now. There's there's public education is in a state of crisis right now in my mind, and the the people don't realize teaching conditions are children's learning conditions. You can't beat down teachers and expect children to benefit. You just can't do it. Well, back to my classroom. So, <laughs> so, um, 
So we were so and after so Clark and I we had um, we learned through uh, this electronic portfolio program that uh, hey you know giving kids autonomy is a good thing and then so between 2000 2001 2004 you know I'm slipping and sliding Clark and I are emailing back and forth and if you have a buddy you have a colleague that you connect with that you have dialogue with that is the best thing in the world that is the best thing in the world I think for teachers to have co-collaborators and people to share feedback with and to and to, to do action research in the classroom. I mean, that's what a tab classroom is. I mean, we're knowledge uh, constructors. We're creating knowledge in there. We're finding things out, discovering new things about ourselves, and, and creating new art forms. So, uh, so what Clark and I did, uh, we, we started to dialogue back and forth. And he said, hey, by the way, um, we're, you know, we're going to present a, a nationals in uh, Denver in 2004 on our electronic portfolio project. Uh, by the way, uh, there's these people, uh, they do this, uh, this form of art education called TAB. <laughs> and anyway, Clark says, I've set up a lunch meeting with them. And we're going to meet them over at Pox for lunch. And... Um, so I said, sounds good to me. Uh, as long as I can make it to my brother, my brother and I have a golf match at, a, at, Sir, at my brother lives in Denver. And I said, my brother and I have a, have a golf match. As long as I can make the meeting before the golf match, I'm good to go. So, so we went. We went to uh, uh, visit with Diane. We went to visit with Kathy. We went to visit with John Crow at Pucks and. Um, and so we started talking, and Diane, Kathy, and John described the TAB program to Clark and I, and we listened to it. You know, it sounded something, you know, it clicked to us. And so we said, you know what? When we get back, we're going to start TAB in our classrooms. So the spring of 2004, we started, we both started doing TAB in our classrooms, and boom, it clicked. I mean, it was like, blammo. Uh, and so the, the next year, I refined my centers. I had like four or five centers. I had a drawing center, a painting center, a cardboard center, and a block, oh, and a computer center, and a block building center. And what I, what I saw happening was, you know, I explained to the boys and girls, guess what, now we're working from your ideas. And so you're gonna, you're, you know, George Sakelli says, artists are always planning. They're always thinking ahead. They're planning ahead. Boys and girls, guess what? It's on you now. You're going to start planning. Now, I'm here to help you get your ideas off the ground. But now, you know, we're going to see what you're, what you're all about. And, of course, some kids have trouble. And so that's why you have you know, teacher-directed lessons. You have, uh, you have uh, Nan Hathaway wrote a wonderful essay, an article on... 10 different ways teaching and learning takes place in the TAB classroom. And if you, can hook, if you can find that article, it's a great one. But, you know, I saw right away in my room how learning was taking place. It was all over the place. It was an explosion of learning. And uh, one, one, of the, one of the groups that I watched was these boys collaborating. And this one boy drew, he had a small piece of paper, and he drew, he was really good at drawing dragons. Of course, our nickname is the dragon. So our school nickname is we're the New Palestine Dragons. And uh, so uh, the one boy, he drew a, a, a dragon on a piece of paper, and all of his buddies are like, man, that is a cool dragon. So his buddy, his buddy Alex says, you know what? I'm going to draw me a cool dragon, and I'm going to make it bigger. So he says, Mr. Gaw, can you get me hooked up with a big piece of paper? I said, sure. So I got the bulletin board paper out. He started drawing the dragon. Uh, with ink and paint, and but he ran out of space, so we had to keep adding paper to it. <laughs> Pretty soon, it was as big as the wall, and so uh, so I said, um, I said, you know, this is a pretty cool mural that you've made, and you know, this is a this is what is possible in a tab classroom when you have child-driven, learner learner-directed kinds of 
activities taking place. <coughs> and uh, this was in 2005 that this painting took place. And it just so happened in Boston, uh, NAEA was having a national conference uh, in Boston, and uh, um, Diane, Kathy, and John, who are affiliated with Massachusetts College of Art, uh, were having a tab um, ex exhibition of student art from anywhere in the country. So they were getting shipments of children's work. And uh, so I sent, I sent what I had over there, and, um, uh, and it was later on when the, when the, the gallery uh, exhibit opened, you know, it was a tremendous exhibit. And uh, Kathy has it online, I think, somewhere. I, if you go to the Teaching for Artistic Behavior site, I think there's a link to it. But it was a knock'em, sock'em, rock'em, sock'em exhibition of children's art. And um, uh, all kinds of interesting works uh, generated by little kids. And as you all know, you, I mean, we, we see it in our classrooms all the time. And so why does this happen? What is, what is the special event? What is the, what is the special dynamic taking place in a tab classroom? And it has everything to do with Mother Nature. Because children are naturally endowed, they're natural learners, and you unleash the natural creativity that they are endowed with in a tab classroom. And it it's, it's goes back to this, this thing I was talking about, genetics. And we're evolutionarily, evolutionarily uh, hardwired, biologically driven to develop language in a natural form and to create in a natural form. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but, we, but when you, you, know, you give kids, you give them a little inspiration, Give them, a, point them in a direction. You know, boom! They will take off on a line of thinking. They are ready to go. And now, granted, some of them have been stultified. Some of them have issues with gen with generating an idea and expressing it in three or four, uh, two, three or four dimensions. Uh, is it is an issue, and that's why tap teachers have a. You know, we have multi. We have, have all kinds of ways that learning can be transmitted in a tab classroom. Uh, there's also uh, letting kids incubate. Letting them incubate. Letting them find out what they're good at. Letting them connect at a deep emotional level. You know, education today is primarily concerned with the affective. I'm sorry, not the, with the cognitive, and not the affective. They don't really think about the affective. Uh, with standardized learning experience, basically, primarily uh, driven, you know, towards cognitive information processing, and then uh, retrieved or uh, then assessed through data-driven learning or data-driven assessments. And um, so the children get, uh, you know, but children are hardwired for emotional learning. They're hardwired for to. Uh, they're hardwired for multi-sensory learning. Eric Kandel won a Nobel Prize in the year 2000 for his research on learning. And what is learning? It's retrieval of memory. It's retrieval of memory is what learning is. And so, uh, so how do organisms learn best? Through multi-sensory learning. And what do we do in our schools today? Doesn't look too much like multisensory learning to me. Very little, and that means hands-on <coughs> learning, and um, uh, and or or visual learning, or musical learning, uh, whole body learning. And so uh, you think about. And if I go off on a tangent, uh, please forgive me. But I want to say something about public education and private education. John Dewey said, what the wisest parents want for their children, that must we want for all our children. And if you look at where the opulent minority send their children to school, not public schools. In Silicon Valley, they're sending their kids to private Waldorf schools 
where they, the children engage in singing, dance, theater, art making, um, lots of hands-on, multi-sensory learning experience. And it's not happening in the public, in the public realm. It's something else. And so I, I have a problem with that. And so I've become more militant as I've gotten older and, um, and become more of an activist. And um, I spend a lot of time at the Indiana State Capitol. It's like banging your head against the wall. Um, you talk to these people, they'll smile and nod their head. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and then, what the, then they institute policies that are bad for kids. So I told you about that block center. And boy, uh, that place, one of, one of the things Victor Lowenfeld discovered in his research was that you have two, before Howard Gardner was talking about multiple intelligences, Victor Lowenfeld said, hey, we have visual learners, we have haptic learners. Haptic learners, these are the hands-on guys. They're the hands-on kids. They're really into all this. And I think my block center is a, it's a, uh, it's a little uh, place for all of our haptic learners to go. They're really in the building, and they can really express themselves really well at the block center. So here's like some of the sculptures over there get super huge. Over here is the best view of the city. Yeah, look at how I mean, our block center has opened our eyes into STEAM and STEM. And, you know, we, I, I try not to do lessons that are, you know, do, you know in, an integrated lesson directly into, you know, uh, I, I want, if the child has an idea that's related to STEM, boom, we're on it. If it's child-driven and it's STEM-related, we are on it. And so art is a big subject. It's a big subject, and it connects so all, all over the place. So um, you think about what engineers do, they're doing design, and that's the same thing that artists do. And so, uh, so when we do, we do STEM that's child-driven, uh, I have a fetish for airplanes. And so, uh, so I'm always playing around with airplanes, and, uh, and we do have a shortage of pilots in this country. And so I'm always you know, trying to get the kids interested in, in my my fascination with airplanes. I'm trying to make a kite out of card, but I've not done it yet, but we do make gliders. So, and I'll show you some gliders here shortly. But, um, but cardboard is a wonderful medium because you know what, it's free. <laughs> and uh, so let's take a look at some of our, our earlier attempts at flight and, and cardboard construction. So here are, these are the wild boys. The wild boys. Where are you going to do it Where it's going to go. Oh, that's cool. Now we're going to go visit the real wild boys in a second. So, well, here we go. All right, I'm coming over here. What's going on? Five, four, this. three. <laughs> something, then you got to deconstruct it. So, so, so we, we built the airplane that you saw in the first part, so now it's time to test the airplane and see if it'll, it'll fly. Introducing <laughs> Shane and Austin and Nick. So we took it back in for repairs, and then we'll see if we can get it to fly again, so. Um. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, my God. Look at the damage. So we'll take it, take it back in for more repairs. So we're getting better at airplane, at our airplanes. We're getting better at it. I couldn't let it see if you could let it rip. Let's see it go. Let's see it go. Whoa! 
This is a, one of our smaller airplanes. Test it. Let's take it out in the hallway where we can really, really test it. And throwing an airplane is an art form too. Throwing an airplane, launching it with our hand—that's a real, that's a real art form. So we have some really big ones. I wasn't able to. I wasn't able to hook up the video to that. I'm so, I'm so sorry. We've got some that are like four feet long that really do fly, and and they're just the, you know they're just thrilled to death to be able to build these things. And gosh, we didn't know we could make these things in here, Mr. Goff. But uh, so then we so then back to the wild boys and the uh, and the, the the block building. So so we started experimenting with chain reactions I'm sorry oh what are the, what are they those are wood planks that were that were saved from a camp attack and they were going to get thrown out and they were wood planks so we just scavenged Blocks wherever. Now we've got like 3,000 blocks. We just scavenge blocks wherever we need to get them. talking about whole body experience earlier and you know some of these construction pieces are big and they work in teams and they and you think about play I want to talk about play children are hardwired to play and what we do in schools is criminal we take away their play but you know what they learn best through play they learn best through play and in a tab classroom they can play and uh, and and guess what uh, they can self-regulate they can form. Uh, they could. They could form groups, and they can negotiate how they're going to operate within the group. Because you know, you know what? If I don't like you, or I don't like your game, I don't have to play. I can quit the game. And so, uh, uh, so there's they're in the self-regulation through play. And when they build these pieces, you know, they're they're negotiating, and they are. A lot of the boys are. Are, they're really, you know, I was in Dale's room yesterday, and, you know, the boys who want to do block building, they're, I mean, I saw that. They, it's universal. They're forming groups. They're negotiating. And the girls do it, too, not just the boy. The girls, the girls get in there, and, uh, and they'll rough and tumble with the boys, and, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll negotiate and communicate. And there's uh, something at stake. You know, we got to, this is, we're, this is high stakes. This is really high stakes. Because we're working with balance. And if somebody isn't careful, it could knock over, knock our structure over. And so, uh, so we're, and then they'll always leave the next class a, a letter. Please, don't knock over our block city. You know, we see those letters all the time. Please, this is, this is our, this is our, our building of Lucas Oil Stadium, uh, don't knock it over, you, and, and, or stay out. And then, uh, but uh, you know, it's so blocks are really, uh, it's a big deal. And then, so what we can do with that block event, and of course, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a it's, it's an event that is uh, it, it's 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 momentary. It's here for you know. So what do we do? We try to digitize with as, with our cameras, and I just use my little camera. I've had all kind of cameras throughout my career, but that one right there is, works really good. It's a phone camera. I just take shots of, you know, the artwork or a hand, 
or ahead, you know, withholding the art. You could, uh, you know, you could identify the child, and you could create an assessment tool, electronic portfolio. And I just keep a large working portfolio that I can always pull up whenever I need to, and say, okay, here's what Johnny did on such and such a day. Now that's what I'm doing after school. Some people. And you know what? You develop electronic portfolios. It feels good to you. You're motivated to do it. Then do it. If it's not working for you, go to what's. As a teacher, you have to do what <coughs> works for you. And it's the same way with Tab. I, I have to create a use, utilize a curriculum that works for me. And this is what I think is works best for my kids, and what I think works best for me. Because I'm really into watching them learn. Because I know that's what's happening. You see it really happening, and it's evident in their writing. So writing is a big part of what we do. We write about our experience. And, uh, and so, the, so the kids are like, you know, I'm a, uh, the boy writes, Mr. Gaw, I have been drawing in art class. Oh wait, I have been drawing in art class ever since Mr. Gaw took the blocks away. <laughs> but I still think drawing is fun. And here's a stick figure. No more blocks. <laughs> but then he goes on to describe a structure. He says, I love art class. One day, Lincoln and Adam and Kent and I built a big tower out of blocks. It was so cool. Uh, but one day, uh, we came to art to see it. And... <coughs> It was still there, except the first graders made it into uh, a marble run. A marble run. A marble run. Okay, a marble run. <coughs> and so, so that you know, it's you never know what's going to happen. There, there's always something new happening in there. It's always changing. So, um, so the block artists. Here's my tribute to the block artists. And. Um, Oh, and, and the electronic portfolio. So here's the oh, here's the gal. She's uh, she's like that gal in uh, uh, in D Dale's room. You know, she's the girl with the moxie, and she we gave them cameras one time, and so uh, she got a chance to get her own film crew together, and so she was going to do an, an interview of the block builder. So here she is. choice-based art activities, and uh, but we had to have a computer lab to, to do the uh, uh, to do the to have kids do more writing on it. Well, the labs 
then primarily were used by the, they were taken away from the art class. So we, so we just do them now. We, if we do uh, writing on the computer, it's, we do artist statements, and we will do, uh, uh, we'll do some portfolio development on the little, we have four little computers in our art room, but primarily I just keep a massive computer uh, file system in my own, in, at my own workstation, and I just keep it there and go through and see what everyone's been doing. But, uh, you know, and this feeling of building in three dimensions, you know, this, you know, uh, the feeling of soaring and uh, working with balance and design and uh, in, three, in three dimensions in real time, very appealing to children. And so, uh, uh, so then, you know, we started to see what else we did with blocks, and we started doing chain reactions. Sean, what did, uh, who worked on this project with you? All right, you let me know when you're ready. So then we'll devise ways to, you know, see how, how we can do chain reactions. And I have a big poster. I have a big poster. It talks about gravity and, and chain reactions and and uh, Sir Isaac Newton. And you know, we so we have a our block center has information on it uh, about um, about gravity and that your uh, physics, a little bit of physics. Uh, force equals mc. Where is that? Uh, I'm terrible with math. So I don't know what well, we I have it written up there. So we're so we so we so we talk a little bit about that, and, and it's a little introduction to physics to them. And you know we know about, and they start to use the language. They use the they utilize the language of uh, of uh, physics and 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 STEM through the uh, our block center. So, so we, uh, so I'm looking through uh, recently. You know, block building has become really big. You know, this is like a 2000, 2008. It's always been big. I mean, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Gehry, block builders. Who I mean, they're all. It's been big since. You know, it's a, it's a good thing. Designing, implementing. Uh, design ideas through block building, and it has so many benefits, intellectual benefits. So, uh, so, so there's uh, uh, one thing I've been doing is rereading Elliot Eisner. I know Dr. Eisner passed away recently, and um, uh, and he's he done he's done a lot of theoretical research and curriculum and in learning, and um, and he wrote. Uh, Piece, he said, what, what if standards are not a good thing? What if standards are not a good thing? Because with standards, you have to standardize. And Jackie Grennan Brooks, who wrote, uh, who's an expert on constructivism, she's out of Hofstra, um, she wrote uh, a piece recently about you know, common core standards. What we don't want to have happen is, you know, uh, a uh, mass production assembly line uh, approach to assessment, but you know, that's kind of what's happening. And um, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned, well, actually more than concerned, but she, she wrote an interesting piece, and uh, I'll, uh, I highly recommend TAB art teachers read it. Uh, uh, TAB art teachers, though, the way we incorporate standards is we, we have the room is a living, breathing lesson plan loaded with learning. And it's, it's, a, it's a laboratory for learning, a laboratory uh, to, for creativity. And I, I don't fear the standards, but I fear how the standards are used uh, for a lockstep approach to learning. Uh, TAP teachers have nothing to fear from the standards, but, um, but I, I, I don't like to see uh, linear approaches to curriculum, because then it if you like linear approaches to curriculum, they're great if you view children as blank slates. <laughs> you know, if you take out that variable, it's a great thing. 
But children are not blank slates. They're not. So how do you, you know, I've yet to, nobody in education reform has uh, provided teachers with a viable conception of the human mind. A conception of the human mind that uh, provides a, a rationale for why one size fits all is a good thing. It's efficient for the teacher and for curriculum writers, that's for sure. But I think there's collateral damage that takes place for a lot of kids. And so, uh, so Eisner, uh, one of Eisner's great quotes, I, I love this, is that when birds have led their lives in a cage, it is not difficult to understand that when the door is open, they may not want to leave the cage. And um, he says something else very profound, I'll share it with you later. Um, but here, here we are with our block builders again, we're designing things. Um, What's it going to do? Show me what it is. Forces of nature for children. For, children are forces of nature. They are beings in and of themselves. They're not beings in becoming. You know, they're not becoming adults. They are beings. They are what they are. They are nature unleashed. Those of you who are elementary teachers, uh, my heart goes out to you. I'm one too. Because their <laughs> minds, you know, Eisner says, you know, we're all born with brains. But the mind is called to develop through culture. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, the, the mind is, uh, it's, it's a, uh, the mind is an inconceivable globality. How do you, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you talk about the mind? How do you describe it? We all have one, but how, I mean, it's like this <coughs> container of memories, and then I have executive functions of. Um, everyone's different, and and, the, and so uh, Deleuze and Guattari are these French guys, and they're philosophers and educators, and they wrote uh, a piece about rhizomatic thinking. And if if you think about the mind as a rhizome, a metaphor of the of the mind could be a rhizome. If you think about uh, aspen trees and how they grow on the side of the mountain, but underneath the soil, the root system is all interconnected. So you think of a rhizome as an interconnected root system. Well, a, a, a rhizome metaphor for the human mind that could apply to that, and it could also apply to a, uh, a, a learning experience, a curriculum experience, in a choice-based art room. Because the, the curriculum in a choice-based art room is very dynamic. It changes. Each class is different. In a linear curriculum structure, the, the classroom dynamic, it's not, you know, it's, uh, the curriculum is static. We know what the final outcomes are going to be. In a choice-based art room, we don't know what the final outcomes will be. You might get an eight-foot-tall dra red dragon. Uh, <laughs> Or you might get a chain reaction with, uh, uh, you know, that we just don't know. Because the children become the experimenters, the doers. Now they have a voice in the curriculum. They have a say in the curriculum. So it's a wonderful concept, but it's hard to do. It's hard to do. It's physically taxing. It's physically taxing. I've never been in the best shape of my life since I became a tab, tab art teacher. You know, you're constantly on the go. You're, you know, it's low level. You're constantly moving. You're working, and it's and you're teaching, teaching so much in small groups, in individual, in large groups. It's const You're constantly teaching and facilitating, and so. Uh, Back to the block, guys. So, so one day I, I had this idea. Well, we'll bring some marbles and we'll see. We'll see what happens. And teachers can be the, you know, we are the the people who can change the setup. We can change things around. And 
and activate change. And we'll, and, and we'll see what happens. So I brought the marbles in. <laughs> And I, and I, I handmade a couple new pieces of blocks. And this, this marble then lost a bunch of marbles. Lost, I said, I, I said, look, if we're gonna do marble rooms, that's great, but guess what? You gotta control your marbles. Don't lose your marbles. <laughs> oh, we gotta keep. Oh, you guys gotta keep our marbles. Don't lose your marbles. So now we're getting pretty good at controlling our marbles. No, wait, no. Go there. So now we're getting really good at building gravity machines. We're building machines now, powered through gravity. I don't know what this movie is. This is a test. So while these guys are at the, at the block building center, the other kids are all around making other forms of art. So there's a whole, they're all doing different things. Ready, 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 go! Our room's a little noisy. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the children are, are forces of nature. They are um, energy. They are balls of energy. And, and, you know, you think about what happens to them in the regular school day. They're <laughs> constricted. They are suppressed. And uh, they are, you know, sitting in a chair. A lot of, you have a lot of great places, great educators who recognize this and make certain that children have, you know, time away from the seat, time away from their chairs. But I see a lot of kids sitting at desks. If, you know, a kid could be out of his desk all day long, you know, expending energy uh, and learn and, uh, you know, it would be a natural thing. It just would be a natural thing. Uh, and, you uh, but that's not what schools are about. We're, you know, we have a kind of like, you know, it's, in my mind, it's not a natural thing what you do to kids in a regular public school. They, it's not natural. I have other words to use to describe it. <laughs> it's not natural. But, um, so getting back to boys and, their, and, and girls, you know, they all have, They are balls of energy. They have minds that. Oh, and I'm sorry. This is all, this is all devoted to block building. So here we have all these different kinds of construction pieces with blocks, and um, and discovery learning just taking place all over the place, and using our own mind to set up an experiment with blocks, or set up a design concept. Oops. So, getting back to curriculum, and the metaphor of the rhizome. So, decontextualizing art making. Now, when you, do, you know, even the best DBAE teachers will have to suppress a child's time-sensitive idea. You know, a child says, comes into your classroom and says, uh, Mr. Wag, that's cost all that. Uh, Mr. Wag, I've got a idea uh, that I want to do today. Well, Johnny, today we're painting, we're doing uh, impressionism. Uh, you know, and so, uh, so negating that child's idea, uh, I, you know, it's like, uh, 
And uh, I don't think that's, that's a good thing. I think we should, you know, the child has a line of thought. It could lead to something else. Uh, sure, I could, you know, and Nan Hathaway wrote a brilliant piece on smoke and mirrors. On smoke and mirrors. Um, if anyone has not read Smoke and Mirrors, you've got to read it. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Art Education several, uh, several months ago. It is brilliant. And she dissects and analyzes you know, the, 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 the school in the style of school art style kinds of art activities. And uh, she breaks it down, deconstructs it. And, you know, that's a, you think about the, uh, the artists from ancient times. They didn't have a person, you know, providing them with sequences and step-by-step and -step instruction. They put it together on their own. They figured it out on their own. Like at the, the first, uh, like uh, Buckminster Fuller says, we, you know, trial and error and discovery learning. And um, so, um, you know, we figure things out on our own, and we let kids do the same thing in a, cho a choice-based art group. So back to rhizomatic curriculum structures and, and the metaphor of the rhizome to describe what goes on in a tab classroom. You know, you could call it rhizomatic, you could call it democratic education, really, what you could call it. Uh, you could call it a, a bunch of things. You could call it differentiated learning. It really is differentiated. Yeah, like um, Child-centered. Uh, it's learn learner-directed. Um, but it's a good thing. And you rec and have teachers recognize when they see it uh, that it's, you know, the kids are on fire. They are in, in what Mihai Csikszentmihalyi said is flow. They're in, psych they're in a psychological state of nirvana, what they're in. And so uh, before I let my kids in the room, I meet them out in the hallway. Because once they walk in the room, they're turned on. I can't even get to my five minute lesson without a nomadic learner going off on his own. He doesn't even, he doesn't even want to listen to the five minute lesson. He's ready to go to town. Nomadic. Yeah, he, 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 and that's what you call it. You call nomadic learners. It's it's a term in, in rhizomatic learning situations. So I get them out there and I tell them, hey, don't go in the arm yet because, you know, we got this, this, and this ready. Uh, so, so here's a setup of my room, pretty much. Here's where we'll meet. We'll do a large group demonstration right there. And then here's our wet center. We have a wet, Clark has a, he's, and, and we, those of you in the tab Facebook page devoted to, uh, room design, we have like the wet, you have the wet zone, you have the dry zone, uh, wet things happening in here, dry things over here. I love Dale's room, she's got a giant <coughs> drying rack that I think is wonderful, and it's kind of creates a natural zone in her room, but my room is just like tables all over. I've taken these tables out and just made it like a big space. I move these tables over here. So now we have the wet zone. We have a big open floor space here. We have a floor space here for the, the builders. And then we have a computer center right there. Library and class center here. And then kids, and then over here is our cardboard and our paper mache. And paper mache is kind of like a wild thing in our, in our room. And I don't, I should, I should have brought pictures, I did. But, but back to the metaphor of the rhizome. Could be a metaphor of mind because you could you, you could be in a line of thought. Now, right now, I'm in a line of thought. I'm trying to hold my mind together so I can talk to you all. <laughs> Normally, I'm in a most of rhizomatic mode of thinking. I'm like I'm thinking, okay, I gotta get my presentation done, but but oh wait, I gotta I'm supposed to call my wife up at seven o'clock, but then I'm thinking, oh, wait, and I gotta go to my brother's house. Let me get back to the presentation. Maybe so. I'm you know your mind is rhizomatic. You're thinking. All these, it's going in different areas. So if I can follow a line of thought, and follow this line of thought, and I can maintain focus on it, that's the same way with the learning experience. If I can follow a line of thought, 
and follow it. And I'm really passionate about this line of thought. And, I'm, and I can remember my memories of this line of thinking are going to stick. And Eric Kandel, back to Kandel's research, you know, multisensory, emotional connection. You know, when you have the neurotransmitters, uh, serotonin, uh, dopamine, which is a pleasure neurotransmitter, and, um, oh gosh, I forgot the third one. Um, now my mind went blank. Rhizomatic. Uh, uh, there, uh, the, the, uh, you, you have, uh, it'll come back to me, I'll come back to that later. But you have those neurotransmitters of the serotonin, the big one, related to multisensory learning. And when they are, uh, when the mind, when the brain is engaged in those kinds of learning activities, serotonin is, it kicks in and it's produced, it's more, oh, adrenaline was the other neurotransmitter. Adrenaline. Did you, did you say adrenaline? Yes. Yeah, adrenaline was the other one. Adrenaline. Adrenaline. Um, <clears throat> do you remember those things? You remember the, you remember when adrenaline kicks in? You have those three things working with you. You you create memories that last for a long time. That's the problem with data driven education. Uh, you know, you have a selected response worksheet. You fill it out. Like, okay, I filled it out. Uh, do I remember anything on it? Um, you know, after a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, you know, the leaky vessel thing where the water leaks out of the vessel, I can't remember now. Uh, what, I, what was I doing on that worksheet? Um, but I know scaffolding is to be built in. But again, multisensory learning, critical if you're going to embed long-term memory, uh, long-term learning uh, in, in a learning experience. So. Uh, so, cur uh, curriculum experiences that are rhizomatic. Oh, well, this is, yeah, this is a girl. She was working on this for a long time. And it's her tribute to her dog, Boxer. <laughs> so here we start. We'll start at here with our large group instruction, our five-minute instructional time, after we've had our hallway instruction. Um, and uh, we'll begin the class right here. And we'll pre pretend today that we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci because he's like all about STEM and all about transdisciplinary learning, which art is all about. So then I'll say, okay, the, you know, here's your information, boys and girls. Uh, now you can go off and work at a center. And boom, we're off and running. I mean, this was, this was like a Dale's room yesterday. After the girl said, are there any questions? And then Dale said, okay, you guys can go go to a center. And boom, they were out. They were, they were at it. They were going to town. And uh, so then, then it's interesting to see what happens. Things begin to shift. Then the rhizome begins to change. And I, in 2006, I wrote about rhizomatic curriculum without really knowing what I was writing about. And I was describing, we were having a conversation with uh, the uh, editor of the, uh, the webmaster of the Incredible Art Department. And, uh, and so I was, we were t because TAB was relatively new and, and uh, still relatively, relatively new. And I was describing to her what my classroom was about and telling her that, um, uh, uh, that you know, we can, you know, once kids move to a center, then they can shift. And so I said, well, the paints, the, the, the cardboard construction workers uh, hooked up with the kids at the paint center, and they turned their cardboard construction pieces into stick puppets. They painted them, and then they went over to the, to the puppet center, and then they did a puppet play. <coughs> so we're hitting all these, uh, you know, transdisciplinary learning. And now we're using language development uh, to do a, to, uh, in, and imagination and language to uh, devise a puppet play. And now we're going to rehearse, and now at the end of class we're going to do a puppet play for our classmates. And so we get into great theater and uh, all kinds of wonderful
transdisciplinary learning experiences taking place. And so that's uh, that's the uh, uh, that's what arises. My conception of the tap classroom is uh, it's rhizomatic, and uh, uh, and so uh, rhizomatic on two levels on you know the the way the mind operates and also the way the curriculum operates. So uh, and the nomadic learners can go off on a line of thinking and they can go off and, and uh, investigate, do a long-term investigation. Uh, Noam Chomsky, who, uh, uh, you know, he says that's a wonderful thing for children. Anyone who's familiar with Chomsky's work knows that he refuted B.F. Skinner's claim that all learning is through behavior, behavior modification. And Noam Chomsky wrote uh, a piece called Syntactic Structures he said, you know what, language is not developed through a uh, behaviorist uh, learning paradigm. It's, it's learned, there's an innate capacity. It's innate, it's genetic. We have genetic, uh, we're biologically hardwired to use language like a little girl who in, was in Dale's room. When she went off, you know, Dale didn't tell her, uh, you know, no, she didn't. She, the girl was not prompted by anyone. It was just a natural thing for her to say, well, are there any questions? And so that's, you know, that is, uh, it's, a, it's innate. And so we should be uh, looking to connect learning through children's interests, through their innate capacities, because you're going to get a bigger bang for your efforts. You're going to get a bigger bang out of the learning experience when you do that. You, the children will remember it, and they feed on it. And it's an emotion, uh, emotional, uh, emotional, and uh, emotional forms of learning. That, that's it. Tab is like the it's that's the big enchilada in school right now. And Kirsten Ho Chan, I I found an article by Kirsten Ho Chan. And she writes about rhizomatic curriculum in preschool and how it's, it's a, a natural kind of way for children to learn uh, uh, in preschool settings. But I'm like, well, you know what? It's good for us, too, for elementary. And it's good. I've seen it operate in, uh, in, in other settings. And I know there's high school people doing TAP. And, uh, and I have a colleague, uh, 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 several colleagues in high school who are doing TAP. Uh, Jeff Preeti is... Uh, is doing TAB uh, in Minnesota, and uh, he uh, was the former head of the Minnesota Art Education uh, Association, and uh, he, he's a he's a, a big time TAB proponent at the high school level. I have a colleague, uh, Barb Andrews, and she doesn't do TAB; she does learner directed learning, and she uses uh, her her own way to uh, propel learner directed experience. And it's with contracts, and I've seen she's shown me how she does contracts, and so it's possible. It's possible. You know, I was doing it in college. You could do it at any grade level. You could do it at any stage in, in learning with any kind of heterogeneous group. And uh, oh, back to back to. Uh, I'm going to go back here for a second and read what Kirsten Ho Chan has to say about involving young children in decisions regarding curriculum development is underpinned by the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the, child, of the Child and is gaining support around the world. In Canada, the province of British Columbia, she's from British Columbia. Uh, in uh, Canada and the province of British Columbia, for example, has embedded children's right to participate in early learning framework, in, in, in its early learning framework. However, as outlined above, child's Child participation in curriculum making is complex, and it requires both a clear commitment and ongoing effective actions to make it a living reality. How do you spell her last name? Uh, Ho Chan, H O C A, uh, yeah, H O, and then separate C H A N. That's close. So, um, with, with children, 
you have heterogeneous groups, how do, how do, how do people who are vested in one-size-fits-all standardized curriculum account for heterogeneous groups of learners? They, they don't. <laughs> they don't. But tab art teachers can. Or choice-based art, art teachers could. And so, so we are all about turning kids on to self-directed learning. And I'm going to go, I'm going to come back now to what Elliot Eisner said uh, in his uh, Lowenfeld lecture at NAEA in Chicago, and he said there are two kinds of education in this world. The first is to educate children so they will have a chance to unfold, and I'm paraphrasing it. The first is to educate children so they will have a chance to unfold unhindered by forces that would divert them from their natural progression of development. The second form of education can be seen in totalitarian nations where the state imprints onto children's minds what the state values. And I'm going to end, you know, I did not talk about the secret art of the ways today. I'll talk about that later. Um, but, um, but I think it's so important to give children a voice. And here I want to, I want to read to you what uh, Mike said. He said, when I was at my other school, being creative was fr especially frowned upon. I made an alien clown and I got a D. One time we were making self-portraits and the teacher said, if you don't do it right, you'll have to do another one. I used red, and she said, don't use red. You did it a wrong way. Um, it just makes me feel mad. My art wasn't appreciated there. So, I will talk about the secret art of boys later on. And, uh, that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother chapter in this story. And uh, Adam and all of the Colorado tab Hundred education participants, thank you so much for letting us speak to you. Pick his brain and try to figure out better that chromosomic thing that I'm still trying to understand as well. <laughs>